let me get started with our uh, first uh, agenda item, which is <laughs> what I described as some lecture on heat engine cycles. Um, I had a sense that this was needed um, <laughs> without kind of going into detail of exactly what it's going to be. And um, I guess this is uh, what I wanted to start out with. It's um, sort of a um, bit of a um, philosophical, almost a meandering question of um, why do we cover thermodynamics? In physics specifically, I mean, because, um, you know, thermodynamics, if you've taken chemistry, you've covered it. And uh, things like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing here. Let's see. Um, so if you're looking at like things in chapter two, um, ideal gas law, you've, if you've taken chemistry, um, you have seen it in chemistry and things like heat capacity and even maybe distribution of molecular speeds. All those are, all these are stuff covered in chemistry and in chemistry you actually go into more depth about ideal gas laws and more detailed applications of that. So um, the natural question is, why do we cover this in physics? And there's a purpose to it uh, rather than just uh, um, repeating it. And it's a, uh, and you can kind of see this um, almost uh, um, <laughs> existential question on why do we cover thermodynamics in lower division physics in um, sort of a, a variation you see dif between different textbooks and um, different schools covering thermodynamics at different places. When you are looking at things like mechanics, modern physics and electromagnetism, those are standard. Like every school starts out with the mechanics, Newtonian mechanics that you have seen in physics 4A. Every school covers uh, electromagnetism in the second semester. And almost every school covers modern physics, special relativity, quantum mechanics in the third semester of calculus-based physics. And um, and thermodynamics is uh, the one topic that you will see covered in uh, different semesters. You, you, it's possible to cover it in the first semester. You can somehow fit that in. And it's also possible to cover it in the third semester, maybe just before quantum mechanics. Uh, you can actually almost see that in um, how we covered, I think, uh, uh, some of the chapter one material. Because in chapter one, we talked about, you know, the textbook covers Stefan Boltzmann law in, I guess, under mechanisms of heat transfer. And we almost do nothing with it. And if we are doing quantum mechanics, then it leads naturally into black body radiation and uh, Planck law. <laughs> so it's a, it's a good question, you know, why do we, um, both why do we cover thermodynamics and where does it fit into lower division physics curriculum? And I do believe um, it should be covered and covered in a way that it's distinguishable from, um, from how it's covered in chemistry, because this is the one topic where there's a quite a um, big, quite a deal of overlap between uh, what covered in chemistry and what's covered in physics. And really the place where you start to see that distinction, I think, is in chapter three, when we start to talk about mechanical work, because that's the kind of thing that we physicists care about. So when you start to see the description of work done, by, uh, by a system, and we use the word system and almost always in this lower division physics class, whenever we are talking about a system, we are actually talking about uh, a, a, a system of gas, ideal gas. So uh, we describe work done by a system in terms of the pressure of the gas and the change in the volume of the gas. So this was our week two material. So when we start to talk about mechanical work done by thermodynamic system, then that, and that's where you start to see uh, something that you would only see in physics class. 
and um, and what we are co covering in this week, week three, I'm hoping to fill in a bit of a gap that I see in our textbook, and um, and it might be because um, I'm kind of remembering what I saw in my own physics class when I was an undergraduate student and taking lower division physics. And when I look for those elements in our text, you know, this is probably just about the one thing that I see missing in OpenStax University Physics. Let me sort of highlight what I see missing. So, you know, we talk about um, work done by a thermodynamic system. And your textbook talks about different uh, thermodynamic processes. All, and actually, I do like this coverage of uh, quasi-static and non-quasi-static processes because it kind of explains that every process you described, you see described by a line in a PV diagram is quasi-static. It has to be by definition or by kind of implication of drawing a line on a diagram. And um, it talks about isothermal process and uh, at the end it summarizes all four named processes, isothermal, adiabatic, isobaric, isochoric. It even uses the right word. It doesn't use isovolumetric, which is, you know, I only bring that up to say that I'll never use that particular word. Um, and it covers, um, of course, it covers first law of thermodynamics, which relates the mechanical work done. So I think the first law is the kind of thing that you also see in a chemistry class, but the emphasis is probably different. So when we talk about work done, we are almost exclusively talking about mechanical work done, force time, force done, um, force applied over a distance from which we get pressure times change in volume. And, um, and how that work done relates to heat transfer and change in internal energy. And all of this is relevant in talking about really the one thing that can only be covered in a physics class, which is the question of, um, which is uh, how you reverse something that you are used to seeing in the um, other direction, which is in physics 4A, for example, you are used to seeing uh, work going in this direction from where you have mechanical work. And as you are up, uh, doing the mechanical work on some object through friction, that mechanical work turns into heat. So, you know, in the context of physics 4A, it's a lost, lost energy. And what you never see in physics 4A is a process going in the other direction where um, you start out with some heat energy, thermal energy, and somehow turn that thermal energy into mechanical work. And, and that's what we, um, so that's what we are getting at in this first four weeks of physics 4B. And the first law of thermodynamics, how kind of provides a starting place of how that might be possible that, you know, from the consideration of conservation of energy, that, you know, if you have a heat transfer, if somehow that can be turned into mechanical work. At least the first law of thermodynamics states that, you know, that can be done. It's not inconsistent with the laws of uh, nature. Now, this is the gap I see in your textbook. And the device we use to do that is a heat engine. And you, know, you can kind of see hints of that in thermodynamic process and in the discussion of work done by a system, how as a gas expands, it's doing work in you know, all this diagram and um, connecting all that and putting it into a, almost a practical device is the heat engine. And now when you go to chapter four and look under heat engines, um, you see almost uh, what you would see for a conceptual physics class. Um, th there's this nice but somewhat schematic representation of what a heat engine does, you know, the kind of flow of energy, heat uh, flow in, work out, heat flow out, 
and it's very schematic. And um, it feels like there should be more in the rest of the section, and there isn't. If you, there is some detail covered for Carnot cycle, but your textbook uh, doesn't quite cover any other heat engine cycles, and and I think that is a, a, a real gap because the Carnot cycle by its nature is a kind of theoretical process. <laughs> if it were an engine cycle, it's a very impractical engine cycle. So um, I wanted to show you what I uh, remember seeing in the textbook that I studied the uh, physics out of. So let me join with my other account unshare my screen and spotlight that, um, sorry, I was trying to find this online. And th this is uh, the reason we use OER, which is that it's a lot easier to find online resource that's not encumbered by copyright. So um, I found, I have this hard copy of the textbook that um, I'm, I, it's the same version as what I used when I was studying lower division physics. Let me um, stop sharing here and uh, spotlight the video from my other account. And I think that means um, you are kind of seeing that as the uh, largest video, hopefully. And hopefully my audio is still coming through. So, um, so this is, uh, you know, there are many, um, uh, university physics textbook. This is University Physics by Young and Friedman. It, this is, version is, you know, almost two decades. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, not out of date quite, but it came out about two decades ago. And this is the section that I remember from that textbook. And I, because I remember uh, practical internal combustion engine being covered in quite a bit of detail. So this is the auto cycle, which is, um, probably the majority of heat engine, um, real world heat engines you would see. This is a, a automobile um, engine. It's uh, the defining feature is that there's a spark plug that ignites the engine at the uh, correct point in the cycle. And oops, uh, and if you, um, and this section also talks about, oh, so this is the, diagram for auto cycle, a version of which you see in my other recorded videos. And it also covers the digital cycle uh, down here. And this is the diagram of the digital cycle. So, so you know, that's a kind of um, what I thought was missing looking at your textbook that um, where's the detailed discussion of heat engines. And let me uh, keep uh, reshare my screen and uh, leave this uh, account here. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so now your textbook does have references to auto cycle and detail cycle, and it occurs uh, in a form of uh, uh, textbook questions. Uh, they list it as a challenge problem. So problem 88 in your textbook uh, covers, in some sense, auto cycle. And, the, um, and 89 covers diesel cycle. And uh, I think it's uh, because so much of what we do with a PV diagram can seem like just a mathematical exercise. It, uh, I think it's uh, good, um, useful to be reminded of what practical real world thing these are connected to and um, and that's uh, why we are basically taking out an entire week of our four week schedule for thermodynamics to do an in-depth study of heat engine cycles and um, so yeah, and because uh, this is something that your textbook only covers as a question, <laughs> and you know I don't want to just you know give it to you. Okay, here's the heat engine cycle. Analyze it. That's why I uh, have this these recorded videos to cover them, and uh, the first two lecture videos to kind of cover the general idea. 
because this is an almost uh, mechanical process you can go through. I mean, you know, you can see in the video that it's a fairly lengthy set of calculations. Um, but as you see example over example, you, you will see the repeating part that it's, uh, um, it doesn't take a lot of creativity or um, um, all kind of looking for shortcuts. It can be approached in a systematic way. So, and I do uh, go over auto cycle and diesel cycle specifically. Because those are, um, these two basically cover uh, most of the practical heat engines you would uh, encounter in everyday life. Uh, if you have any electric, like uh, portable power generators, it probably runs on a diesel engine. And if you drive a car, it probably <laughs> has an engine that can be, you know, idealized as an auto cycle engine. So, um, so these, you know, long videos kind of go over more abstract theoretical calculations. And I want you to provide a context for, you know, what is all that for? Uh, why are we taking out so much of our time uh, analyzing these cycles? It's a uh, because it's, they are practical. That's, uh, and they are both one, practical. <laughs> it's, uh, if, especially if you might become a mechanical engineer, then that's, uh, I assume, because <laughs> I'm not an engineer, I assume that's uh, what's going to be in your wheelhouse. And, um, and even if you won't become mechanical engineer, it's uh, a bit ironic, because I think of all the topics in physics, the one topic that has the, broadest real world consequence for is the thermodynamics because so much of our modern society depends on heat engines. And, um, and uh, I, I thought um, your textbook didn't give enough uh, time to looking at the details of those heat engines. So, so that's a um, kind of overview on um, uh, why we are doing what we are dedicating an entire week to. And I'm hoping um, having gone through the analysis of heat engines next week, when we wrap up the thermodynamics, some of the things you will see next week make a better sense for, uh, from, having, for, from your having gone through these heat engine cycles in detail. And uh, I guess one benefit here is uh, your textbook, from my perspective, covers topics in a little bit of a backward fashion. Because in chapter four, like right from section 4.1, it starts out with the second law of thermodynamics. And um, I, I guess it's not all that objectionable. <laughs> but, uh, but so much of the heat engine processes, you can discuss it without an explicit reliance on second law of thermodynamics. And I guess when you do look at in detail, the statement that they give you in section 4.1 is the statement that kind of, you know, you would assume is true, that heat doesn't flow from colder object to hotter object. So, um, you know, I hope this is the kind of statement when you read it, you think, no duh, <laughs> like I never thought it would be otherwise. And, and you can go through quite a bit of an analysis of a heat engine without an explicit reliance on second law of thermodynamics. And that's what you will see as you go through the rest of this week through material. And I'm hoping having seen that, when we start on week four, and um, I kind of point this out in the, chapter four overview video that, um, that you know, because it's uh, useful for you to see different approaches to certain topics and um, kind of looking at how your textbook covers entropy, how it's introduced. Uh, I thought there was a more um, kind of physics-like way to introduce entropy and I do that um, in this video here uh, with the, uh, by the way, I might replace these videos, but um, the ones that replace will be basically identical video. Um, here you will see uh, me give motivation for this expression that textbook introduces as given. And, um, and you know, trying to provide the motivation for this using heat engine, uh, only makes sense if we're talking about heat engine in the first 
a place we didn't rely on too much on the second law of thermodynamics. So, so I hope uh, the week we are spending here um, will be useful. And uh, I guess if it um, wasn't, then there are two upsides, which is one, it was only one week, <laughs> and two, we are almost done with the thermodynamics. And once we start with the electromagnetism in week five, then, um, and this is why I was asking that existential question about thermodynamics. Why are we doing thermodynamics? It's because as we do electromagnetism, we, you will see that we don't really depend on the thermodynamics content for the remainder of this semester. So yeah, that's the second upside that if any of this was confusing, um, you know, you can kind of forget about it after week four, starting with week five, just jump right into electricity and you will never have to, well, not never. For this semester, you won't have to worry about thermodynamics again.